How do you really feel about Gould's recordings of Mozart? It's a travesty. As for Glenn Gould, I think we can all agree on one thing. You cannot put him in one box. He was without doubt one, if not the most gifted, charismatic, eccentric and outspoken musician of the last century. However many opinions we all may or may not have about the man, each of you knows at least one of his recordings that made quite an impression. I'm sure that's true even for Seymour Bernstein, despite his recent very goldish, I would say, statement. I never heard him ever play anything that I thought was beautiful, hmm. even the Bach. As for me, it may surprise many, but if I could only take one recording to that legendary desert island, it would be Glenn Gold's 1981 Goldberg Variations. To prove I'm not kidding, I can show you not only the vinyl disc of that recording, but also of his debut recording, the 1956 version of the same piece. A truly fascinating performance. Gold was a musician with a vision in many areas. Today he would without a doubt have been one of the most prominent YouTubers with probably more subscribers than all classical music channels combined. But he was also way ahead of his time commercially. For example, he openly wondered whether it makes sense to continue making music as we do, since all masterpieces have already been recorded in the most perfect way. The only thing performers have left to do in this day of super recording techniques and super recording artists and super recording engineers, I think that all the basic statements have been made for posterity now. I think what we must do uh, is try to find our way around these things, try to find a raison d'etre. And it is true, Gold never avoided experimentation and often left mainstream approaches far behind. That may be the reason why Simmer Bernstein made such strong statements about the pianist since as he said, some principles of performance practice should not be questioned. There are certain things that are written in stone, I have to say. What makes the video I'm quoting from so interesting is the fact that Ben, host of Tone Based Piano, challenges his view quite strongly and defends the right of the artist to deal with a musical masterpiece in a personal way. Because there is a kind of standardized way of playing the piano, do you agree? That, especially in the conservatory system, with competitions, with 200 recitals a year. A lot of pianists develop a, a kind of predictable, formulaic, um, not so poetic way of approaching the same repertoire. And I think Gould, in a sense, was waging war against that. Of course, this statement is made from a common ground. Both Ben and Seymour consider the current way of interpreting classical music to be very close to the composer's vision. Gold's approach is seen by Ben as interesting, legitimate, but deeply personal, consciously leaving behind the composer's intentions. In the same video, we hear this aspect strongly underlined by Anne-Marie McDermott, who says that our job as musicians is to be human and personal but to remain first and foremost a servant of the composer's original intentions, which she believed was not Gold's primary concern. We're not the creators of this music. We're the recreators of this music. And our job is to hopefully bring our humanity to the music making and our imagination and, and, and who we are without imposing ourselves on the music, that we should just be illuminating what the music is. Gold made several of these eccentric recordings. Best known are Brahms' first piano concerto with the famous intro by Bernstein, the first movement of Beethoven's Appassionata, or Mozart's A Major Sonata. The question now arises, do these interpretations really take us further from the composer's intent, or are they bringing us closer? Is Gold revealing, perhaps inadvertently, some aspects of the authentic voice of Brahms, Beethoven or Mozart that had been shrouded in centuries of dust until then? Could it be that Gold, by abandoning all conventions, disinterested in the possible contempt of his colleagues, was getting closer 
to the composer's intentions rather than further away, just by handling the music in a way like he was playing it for the very first time. Let's zoom in on one piece in particular, the end of Mozart's sonata in A major, the famous Alla Turca. Nowadays, we often hear this piece played fast to very fast. Famous example, Lang Lang. Gold plays this piece in a fascinating way, but much more slowly. Before I continue, first a bit of history. Why did Mozart compose a piece called Alla Turca? Well, as some of you know or not, the Turkish army of the Great Ottoman Empire appeared at the gates of Vienna in 1683. It took a massive coalition of European armies to keep the Turks from staying, probably forever, in the middle of Europe. The Ottoman army lost the battle pretty badly and a few decades later the parties signed an agreement in Vienna. In honor of the occasion, the Turks sent in some of their elite troops, the Janitsaren or Janissaries, to add some color to the event with a military parade. The Janitsaren parade was actually a slow march in which the elite soldiers stepped forward very solemnly to a very intriguing rhythm and melody. The march is still practiced in Turkey today. The dance moves were meant to, to impress, to emphasize the power of the Janissaries. Typically, the soldiers took three steps forward, followed by a fourth step back, while turning slightly, and so on. The people of Vienna were so impressed by the event that they not only preserved and copied some of the Janissary instruments, even built into their later fortepianos, but also implemented the music in their culture, from folkloric tunes until later even operas, symphonies or piano works. So when Mozart wrote his Alla Turca less than a century later, he tapped into a popular tune that he knew would be appreciated by many. Knowing this, what would happen if we use Gold's version of the Alla Turca as background music to that video? Let's give it a try and be surprised. Now, did Glenn Gold arrive at a similar rhythm simply by looking at the score? Probably. But then the question arises, does it come close to what Mozart intended? Can we really deduce this slow tempo from the notes Mozart left behind? To answer that question, we zoom in on an addition by the famous pianist Ignaz Moscheles. Born in Prague in 1794, Moscheles close friend of Beethoven, Mendelssohn and many other composers of the early and mid 19th century, published many of the classical works of Haydn, Beethoven and Mozart. These editions had no full-text ambition at all. Articulation, fingerings and pedal use here reflect Marshall's taste more than Mozart's. Nevertheless, Marshall's was still quite close to that Mozart tradition a tradition that had shaped him as a musician and composer. And when playing music from the past, Moscheles was also known to be quite conservative. Surprisingly, Moscheles now suggests a speed of as much as a quarter note equals 160. Pretty close to Lang Lang's tempo. That speed not particularly sounds as an allegretto that Mozart originally gave for it, nor does it reflect the steps of the Janissary March. And keep also in mind that still in Marshall's time, a presto was considered twice the speed of an allegretto. So basically, we should have a margin of doubling the tempo in which we play the Alla Turca. But could you imagine the Lang Lang version? Double the speed?
bit more less like fast tempos. Not particularly. His diaries commented a lot on the too fast performance of his time. A quote that recently even puzzled the great Beethoven scholar Clive Brown is Morseless comment that, and I quote, In some of the quick movements, I have purposely refrained from giving way to that rapidity of pianoforte execution so largely developed at the present time. End of quote. To which Brown adds the open question of how that could be possible, given that Morseless Beethoven tempos are among the fastest given and many of them truly problematic, in other words, just too fast to be meaningful or even playable. But did Morseless really mean quarter note 160? Maybe not. The solution to this mysterious problem lies in the early use of the metronome where the ticks indicated the subdivision of the note value in the metronome mark. In other words, the ticks refer to the eighth notes instead of the marked quarter note. Sounds weird? Not so much when you know that this dual unity has been a basic principle for centuries and is still applied as such in physics today. The time taken by a pendulum to complete one oscillation is called its time period. Let us calculate the time period for a given pendulum. Here we have a pendulum and a stop clock. Now we will count the time it takes to complete 10 oscillations. Swing the bob to one side and leave it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And now Moshless Tempo suddenly comes close to the way people still dance the Janissary March today. And is just below Gold's 88. I hear you thinking, but if this is true, then all music changes drastically. And the answer is yes. And by the way, playable too. Which is not the case now, as evidenced, for example, by our version of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, recently released on CD and vinyl disc. Link to that recording below. In the course of next year, you will be offered a book of almost 700 pages in which the entire history behind this is explained in detail. It also shows that the experimental Gold was not the eccentric player who just wanted to provoke and challenge everything that is written in stone. He was unique in that he allowed himself to reconnect with music from the past in a fresh and new way, bypassing all the conventions of his time, conventions that had been built and changed over so many generations, something we call tradition today. Was that the case with all his recordings? No, definitely not. With the so-called scandal recordings, well, they are more than worth reviewing through the magnifying glass of history. I would have loved to talk to him about our main project at Authentic Sound, which is Tempo Reconstruction. The question is, is there still a place today for musicians who are openly seeking new, unexplored musical fields? What do you think?